are we looking at? Hi, I'm Mesa Salida, and we're here today to learn all about the science behind the food that we eat. So we thought we'd start right where it all happens, at a farm. This is the biggest science lab that you could possibly imagine. We're gonna visit today with Georgia Organics and Love is Love Farms at Gaia Gardens. We'll be meeting with the farmers who are actually scientists doing all this really hard work to get us the food. And after that, we'll head over to the lab to see just how science is used when we're actually cooking food. There are currently over 7.3 billion people in the world. That's a lot of people to feed. How will we be able to provide safe, nutritious food to all these people? The answer? through changes and advances in the agricultural system. On this episode of Surrounded by Science, we'll learn about how a local farm uses science to help in yielding crops. Love is Love Farms at Gaia Gardens is one such farm that works with the earth, using bio-friendly methods to create richer soil and therefore healthier crops. Love is Love Farm is not a place, but the heart work of Joe Reynolds and Judith Winfrey. Operated since 2008, Love is Love Farm aspires to demonstrate that young, landless farmers can build a successful farming operation and actively serve the good food movement through mindful land stewardship. I met with Joe and also with farmer Maxwell Davenport to learn just how Love is Love Farm uses science to create organic, healthier crops. And we're not talking about complex science, but rather natural processes that have been around for centuries. We're lucky enough to be tagging along with Maxwell Davenport. He's one of the managers of the farm here, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how this all gets started. So we're standing in front of a giant pile of what looks like trash to me. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah, uh, it could have been trash at one point, but we actually take it to away from restaurants and make it into compost. Huh? So uh, what is compost? <coughs> <coughs> compost? is organic matter that has been decomposed and recycled as a fertilizer and soil amendment, a key ingredient in organic farming. Uh, well, compost is a kind of a layered uh, pile of uh, vegetable scraps and some type of wood source or carbon source, like uh, sawdust is what we use primarily. And when you layer it up and gather it into a pile, eventually it turns into a fertilizer for our farm. Oh, that's awesome. So, got that the food you eat at the restaurant all ends up back here at the farm in this giant pile, <laughs> and uh, it helps us grow more food. So, what's happening inside this pile, and how do we end up getting fertilizer? Right, so uh, it, when we layer it in the right order and it's given the right moisture content and it contains a good amount of oxygen, uh, bugs and bacteria naturally flock to it to start decomposing the products that we layer in there. Um, and as they work at it and slowly eat it and then different uh, bacteria eat each other and then different animals eat them and so on and so on. Eventually what becomes recognizable food scraps and pieces of sawdust turns into this really fluffy moisture absorbent uh, fertilizer that we spread in our fields. Well, can you show me some of that? Yeah, totally. So we've moved over to this pile which is about 10 months old and it looks really, really different than what we saw before. You gotta check this out. There are bugs and worms all running throughout this thing. Max, what is going on here? Uh, so at around 10 months, uh, the pile starts to cool off from all the bacterial activity. And that's when a lot of the bigger animals start to move in. Um, mostly earthworms, red wigglers, and uh, a lot of roly polies you'll be able to see. And uh, what they do is they start working at some of the tougher to decompose items in the compost pile. Uh, stuff that the tiny little microscopic bacteria can't work at. And how and do they decompose them? Do they just eat it? Yeah, they quite they literally eat it. Um, they eat it and they poop it. They eat it and poop it out, and then things behind come behind them and eat that, and then they poop it out. And so the idea is that when this cycle of eating and pooping and eating and pooping happens long enough, you go from having a pile of you know squash and watermelons to having a pile of it, what looks like and smells like dirt. That's amazing, and this is what is going to help us grow our food. It's a pretty magical resource. Um, it 
takes a lot of time and effort to produce it, but it's totally worth it for how it changes our fields. Now, does it matter if you start with something like squash or watermelon before it breaks down? Um, not necessarily. When you get into adding things like citrus, lemons, limes, oranges, that can start to affect the pH a little bit, but for the most part, you always end up with a pretty neutral substance. So uh, the soil composition and the acidity matters quite a bit when we're going to spread it out in the fields. Can you take me to the fields and show me a little bit there? Yeah, totally, let's go. Organic farming relies on these natural fertilizers like the compost we saw earlier to create healthier soil for crops to grow in. Maxwell explains. Yeah, um, we add compost to our fields every spring. Um, we, we like to add compost when it's about 16 months old. That's when we consider it a finished, a finished product. And um, it has some major benefits, uh, one being the way it changes the soil structure. Uh, so especially here in the southeast, we have a, a heavy clay-based soil, uh, which is, the clay is actually the smallest particle of soil in the world. Um, and so when you add compost to it, which is a, a much larger particle size than the clay, it ends up uh, busting up the clay particles um, and making, uh, it changes the overall soil structure. So what this does is like, as an example, like I can reach my fingers in, um, it, it allows for what's called soil porosity, uh, which means that roots can penetrate the soil a lot better than if it was just clay. Um, and then also another major benefit is its water retention. Uh, so it can hold, compost holds two and a half times its weight in moisture. Um, and also when uh, it receives water, it holds its water a lot longer, so it doesn't dry out as fast. Uh, it provides a more stable growing environment, in other words. So making compost, as the, as the compost decomposes uh, and becomes the product we want to spread in the fields, um, a lot of the nutrition from the original uh, food waste is retained. And uh, because it's gone through that decomposition process, uh, the nutrition that's in the compost is already available for the plants to take, in, take into itself. And once the crops are grown, they're collected and later purchased by local consumers. This is what's called a muscadine. It's a variety of grape. It's one of three native species to North America, actually. Um, all of the other types of grapes that we grow in this country for like wine or whatever uh, were imported here but muscadines are uh, one of the native varieties uh, it's a perennial meaning that it doesn't get rotated around the farm it stays here um, and we just do a little pruning every winter uh, to maintain it um, and then it's um, it's typically ripens in mid to late August is when we typically start to come out here and see if any are getting soft and ripe. Um, if you ask any, if you ask any elderly person who grew up here what their favorite jam was, they would probably tell you muscadine jam is their absolute favorite. Um, so it's southern delicacy. But for the most part, like what's generic is the types of bacteria that are beneficial to plant growth, like the lactobacillus bacteria. The lactobacillus bacteria is literally like covered, it covers the planet. Like it's one of the, it's, it's also like what's considered a probiotic for your gut. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. So like you can ha you can introduce generic forms of what's already here, but you know, the most hardcore like biodynamic farmers pride themselves on proliferating the biology that's already there and then redistributing that and just increasing the amount of the, the natural fauna that you have here. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a, another thing is about introducing foreign bacterias or something, even though if, if it, whether they're beneficial or not, is that that's inherently an input an outside input, which uh, isn't, I mean, that's necessary to sustainable agriculture, but reducing your inputs is also a sustainable practice. Uh, outside inputs, you want your farm to be self-sustaining. So we've 
talk to Max all about what it's like to do science here right on the farm. And we're gonna talk a little bit more with Joe Reynolds, he's a farmer here at the farm, about why organic farming is so important. Not only is Joe a farmer, but he's also on the board of Georgia Organics. So tell me, what is Georgia Organics? Sure, jo Georgia Organics is a statewide organization um, here. And what we're working to do is uh, make sure that, or, or incorporate um, local, healthy, organic food uh, into the lives of all Georgians. And why is organic farming important? So um, on a really simple level, organic farming does try to exclude chemical pesticides and fertilizers, um, fungicides, um, all these things that are manufactured in laboratories um, and, and effectively devoid of life. Um, and that's a really simple answer to the question of why organic farming is important. Um, but the complex answer is, is that farming has to answer um, for the, the impact that it has on the water, the impact that it has on the air, the impact it has on the health of the soil, the impact that it has on wildlife, and the impact that it ultimately has on the workers of the farm and the folks that the farm serves as well. <coughs> Coming up next, we travel to the lab to see food chemistry experiments in action. <coughs> So we're back from the farm where we learn the science behind how food is cultivated. But before that food enters your body, usually it passes from the farm through a kitchen. Now when you enter a kitchen and you're cooking, you may think that you're cooking, but you're actually doing a lot of chemistry. Cooking is full of chemical and physical transformations. So we've come to Emory University to talk to a chemistry expert, Dr. Doug Mulford, and he's going to share with us a whole montage of chemical reactions that really let us see the chemistry behind cooking. So what do we have here? Well, I've selected some reactions to just kind of demonstrate some of the things that you see in the kitchen. So the first one is a reaction that produces a gas. Now this is something you do every time you bake bread and why your bread rises, anytime you use baking soda or baking powder. Ah, when uh, I bake. And also in fermentation to produce the bubbles in beer and wine and things along those lines. And so uh, there's actually all of those represent different reactions. So I have one that I want to show you just to kind of visualize um, how we can make reactions happen and sometimes how we can speed them up a little bit. So first thing is we need to be safe. So if you grab okay. your safe to goggles right. there. Will do. And so what I'm using here is, this is hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide is a chemical that you can get at the local drugstore. Yeah, store. I have it in my uh, medicine cabinet. You do. Um, now the one you have in your drugs, in your medicine cabinet is 3%. That's okay. just how concentrated, how much hydrogen peroxide is in there. Um, and you can get up to 10 or 12% if you're going to bleach your hair. Uh, this is 30%. Okay. This is more fun. Um, so now the th interesting thing about hydrogen peroxide is it's not a stable compound. So it actually breaks down into water and oxygen gas. So we're getting a gas, but the reaction's kind of slow. And so what we're going to see what we can do to speed this up a little bit. So we can look at it, and you might see a couple bubbles from when I poured it in, but not much. Okay. So what we're going to try and to do... bubbles is what we're looking for because we're making a gas. Exactly. Right? Okay. We're making bubble oxygen gas. So we're going to try to capture those bubbles with a little bit of dish soap. So we're just going to put a little soap in here. So tell me, while you're doing this, mm -hmm. when I'm baking, are all those little bubbles in my cake? Are um, those all little bits of gas? They are. Well, they were when they were first made. Okay. So as the gas forms, it expands, and it makes the, the little open chambers. Usually, by the time you've cut into it, it's uh, the gas has escaped. Okay. Uh, but that is what makes it. Now, we can see a little bit of bubbles here, but mostly that's just because I've been stirring it a lot. Okay. This reaction is actually very slow and would take about three months. Okay. Not the best way to cook. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a chemical to it. It's going to act as a catalyst. A catalyst is just something that speeds up a chemical reaction. And the catalyst that I'm using is potassium iodide, and it's a salt. Okay. It's just like table salt, um, except instead of sodium chloride, it uses things a little further down on the periodic table, but same idea, it's a salt. So we're gonna see what happens to this reaction that normally takes three months. We're gonna try to make it go faster, and we're gonna see if we can see the gas that's produced here. So we're gonna try mixing this up, and our reaction is oh just God. a little oh faster. God. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> And also, oh my god, oh! 
this is a reaction that produces a lot of heat. It is really see, warm. Steam coming it's off really of this. It's really warm. Thank goodness we have this plastic tub. And that's often, you know, we add heat to reactions to make them to go faster sometimes, but sometimes they can produce their wow, own heat. Wow, you can see the steam. You get a lot of steam coming off, but you can see how much gas we produce. Now, yeah. when you're baking bread, you produce it a little slower because you want your bread to rise evenly. This is a little Nor dramatic. Nor do you for the want bread. it this big, yes. But it's the same idea. Very cool. Well, it sounds like you have this under control. I'd love to see some more, so can you take it away? All right, sounds good. So the next demonstration I'd like to do for you relates to why we even cook and eat food in the first place. Our body needs food for two main reasons. One is that we need energy to run our body, and the other is because there are particular chemical compounds that our body needs to be healthy. And some of those include things you've all heard of, like vitamins and minerals. So if you look at a cereal like Total Cereal, one of the things they advertise is that they have 100% of many different vitamins and minerals you need. One of those vitamins and minerals is the mineral iron, because your body needs a little bit of iron to make things like hemoglobin in your blood and other things. But the question also comes up about bioavailability. Can your body use it? What's interesting about Total Cereal and other cereals, it's not specific to this one, is that the iron that they use is actually metallic iron. And the iron that we need in our bodies has lost a couple of electrons. It's iron ions. That's what you have in your hemoglobin. So how does that work? Well, first of all, I want to show you how we know that it is um, iron metal that they're using. So if we just take a flake of total cereal, let's get ourselves a nice flat one here, all right? And I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it on some water. So I'm just going to float it here. And then I have some very, very, very strong magnets. These are neodymium magnets. They're like in your hard drive or other things like that to give you an idea of how um, strong they are that can actually hold on to each other through my hand. And I'm gonna take this magnet and I'm gonna bring it down here next to the cereal. And what you're gonna see is that the cereal follows the magnet. Now, how does that tell us what we're wanting to know? Well, it turns out that metallic iron the iron that is in its metal form is attracted to magnets, but when it's an ion form, it's not. So we know that this has to be the form that is the metallic form. So what's going on here? Essentially, this is like ground up iron nails. It turns out your stomach acid is strong enough to dissolve this iron and convert it into the iron ions that your body needs and your body can use it. Interestingly, that doesn't work with copper. And so you'll find that most foods don't include the copper that you need. You need to get it from other sources uh, than your cereals because it's very expensive to make it into the ion form. Uh, and so just a little bit of a quick demo here to show you about the bioavailability of different materials. So the next demonstration I'd like to do for you is to try to help explain why we cool things down in the refrigerator and also heat things up when we cook them. So to make things go a little faster, instead of using food this time, I'm going to be using glow sticks. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my, my glow sticks. So I have three glow sticks for you today. And I'm gonna look at um, cold water, ice water, and I'm gonna look at hot water, um, and then I'm gonna look at just room temperature. So uh, we're gonna take this one here, you can see that right now they're all going about the same um, brightness and because we have chemical reaction going on that produces light. So I'm gonna put this one in the boiling hot water and I'm gonna put this one in the cold water. We're gonna give them just a minute to adjust to their temperature and we're gonna use this one as a control to know what the color looks like to start with. And so when we cook, obviously most of the time we heat reactions up. We heat our food up to make sure it's ready faster because by the time I start cooking, I'm usually already hungry and I'm not that patient and I don't want to wait hours and hours for my food to be ready. Also, there are some changes that won't happen unless you're at high temperature. And so we tend to heat our food up. But after we have the food, if, we've eat, if you've made too much and you want to save some leftovers, we put them in the refrigerator. So what's going on? Why do we do that? Well, the first one we can see already. If I look at the one that's been in the boiling hot water and I compare that now, I can see that it's much brighter. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me that this chemical reaction, the reaction that's producing light, is going much, much faster. So I'm allowed, or I can now have this reaction occur in much less time, and my food's gonna be ready much faster. 
Now, as I said, there are some reactions that won't even happen without increasing the temperature. The most famous of which is probably the Maillard reaction. And the Maillard reaction is what causes meats to brown. And so until you get the meat up over um, 300 degrees, you're not gonna get any of uh, the browning that you see for a nice rich hamburger or steak. Always one of my favorites. So now that you've cooked your food, you've eaten it, you're going to wanna save some of it. And so we look at what happens if we chill it down. And this one's a little more subtle, but you can see that this isn't quite as bright as this one, because as you cool things down, the reactions go slower. And those reactions can include the reactions that break food down. So whether they're bacteria or just material breaking down over time, by chilling it, you slow those reactions down and you can have your food last much longer. So here's why you refrigerate uh, your ingredients before you start and your leftovers afterwards. If you have any leftovers, I tend to always eat it all. Um, and then while you're cooking, uh, if you're impatient like me, this is uh, often why we heat them up. All right, so I've got another demonstration I wanna do for you that again shows a little bit about the heat of reactions, the thermodynamic of reactions. And so we're gonna go ahead and start my burner going here and we're gonna melt some potassium chlorate. And we're gonna try to speed a reaction up um, similar to what we did earlier, but instead of using a catalyst, we're gonna use temperature. This is similar to what happens in a compost heap, why you want the energy and the, the heat to, uh, to happen. It helps the breaking down to occur more quickly. Uh, so we're gonna try this reaction where we're going to have sugar reacting with something called potassium chlorate. Actually the same thing that's in a sparkler that you use around the 4th of July. This is another nice demonstration to show us why we eat food because we're gonna see the energy. Normally when you eat food, you want the energy to be used slowly as you are moving around during the day, uh, as you're walking up your stairs and doing whatever you need to. We're gonna, instead of doing it over an entire day, we're gonna do it all at once. So as soon as this is melted and we're almost there, we're gonna take the potassium chlorate and we're gonna put in one of our gummy bears and we're gonna see what happens when we release all of that energy all at once. So let's take this little Help guy me. on the end Help here me. and drop Help him me. in. I'm There's a lot of energy in that little gummy bear. So the calories that you see on food are a measure of how much energy is available. Here, we release that energy all at once in a bright um, pink to purple color that we actually saw was because of the potassium we had there. But again, we saw that if you heated up a reaction, it happened much uh, more quickly. And we see the energy that's contained in food, which is why we wanna cook it and eat it in the first place. So Doug has shown us a lot of chemical reactions that we might see during cooking, but I don't actually think we've done any cooking yet. We haven't yet. Okay, so can we do some? Uh, of course we can do some. All right. Some. So what, I, what we're gonna do to finish out today is we're gonna make some ice cream. And we're gonna make it similar to the way you might do it at home, but we've got a special little chemistry twist that we're gonna add to it. So um, to make ice cream, we need some heavy whipping cream. So we're gonna add some of that to our bowl here. And Looks delicious already. It is, I, I'm a big fan of heavy whipping cream. And then half and half, so I'm gonna make some really rich ice cream. This is half <laughs> whipping cream and half, half and half. Uh, if you're gonna make it yourself, I say make it the best way that you can. Now of course, we need some sugar. Now a lot of people are very careful in how they measure things out when they cook. I'm not, I just like to add it. Well, I think more. when you bake, you gotta be more careful. When you cook, it's like, uh. You do, yes. Um, and then we're also gonna add some vanilla. Okay. Now, this is one of the things that I do to make the, the ice cream taste even richer, is I add extra vanilla. Okay. You know, it might seem the plainest, but vanilla is actually my favorite ice cream. Yes. So I'm glad we're doing this. Okay, so what I've got is, is a, just a mixture of whipping cream, half and half, sugar, and vanilla. And it doesn't look too much like ice cream yet because we're missing something. Okay. <laughs> we haven't done the temperature change. We need to actually cool this down and make the milk and the whipping cream and everything form crystals to, and make a solid ice cream. Now when I'm home, if I want to make uh -huh. ice cream, I use my little uh, ice cream churn thing and I put some rock salt and water on the outside, and I ice. think. Yeah, ice. And okay. your arm gets really tired. Yes. Now that ice and the rock salt, uh, the rock salt actually makes the ice melt at a lower temperature, so it gets it colder, so it actually goes a little bit faster. I wanna make it go even faster. So okay. what I have is something that I can get hold of in the lab, which is liquid nitrogen. This is 
300 degrees below zero. Uh, so it's very, very cold. It's the air around us that has been chilled so much that it's become a liquid. And you can actually see that oh, wow. when we blow on it. We're actually making a little cloud here. So what we're gonna do is if you can go ahead and put that glove on. I will. Because it is actually cold enough that it can burn. So okay. you have to be careful with it. Okay. So I'm gonna pour I'm this gonna grab in the spoon. while you stir. Okay. So we're just gonna go ahead and stir. And what we're gonna make here. I can't even see what I'm stirring anymore. There you oh, go. Oh, there we go. And it's, it's bubbling. <laughs> it's bubbling, so we're it's Maybe we're getting a, a little again. thicker. Um, and so we're gonna make soft serve ice cream here. And so if we pour the nitrogen into the mixture, we get soft serve. Okay. If you pour the mixture into the nitrogen, you get Dippin' Dots. Really? So two different ways of doing that. It's part of the reason um, why Dippin' Dots are so cold, so fun, and so expensive, because you need liquid nitrogen. Now, normally with that hand crake, we're about I, 45 I'm... minutes here. Uh -huh. So when they make commercial ice cream, they have to cool it down more to, in case the temperature changes a little and it doesn't melt. The result is that you make different types of crystals in the uh, ice cream, and in fact, they're larger crystals. Okay. So we're gonna have smaller, which is gonna make this even smoother. You can't do the so, half and half chocolate? No, no, I haven't learned, I figured out how to do that yet. So one last stir here, and then let me get my cups. So this is gonna be super cold to eat, huh? Yeah, well, this one is okay. The Dippin' Dots, actually, you have to be careful because when you make them, they're 300 degrees below zero. So we've got some ice cream here, and let me, let's get and another scoop here. And these lovely periodic table oh, cups. of course we have the periodic table cups. <laughs> I, I am a chemist, I do enjoy that. And um, so I think, actually, I forgot to bring smaller spoons, so we get to use the big spoons Perfect. for this. So I always think that uh, chemistry, it's cooking, or uh, cooking is chemistry for hungry people, and I love my chemistry. And stuff. so do I. <laughs> That's good stuff. Thank you, Doug. You're very welcome.